Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to do a study on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, as we talked about last week, just to go over these lines simply uh, to understand how we're looking at uh, these lines, how we're looking at these waymarks, how each waymark becomes a line. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this day and for the opportunity to open your word together. We know, Lord, that there's much that we still do not understand, uh, but we know that uh, your Holy Spirit can teach us. And we just ask that as we uh, go through this simple presentation of the lines of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, that you can guide uh, me in presenting and those in watching, that your Holy Spirit can speak to them and that they can understand what I'm saying. Help me to present these things clearly and simply. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good afternoon again. Um, so back in 2016, when I was at the School of the Prophets, um, we were given assignments um, by Jeff in, in our classes. And, um, you know, well, he wanted us to volunteer for assignments. If he could, we could. Otherwise, he would appoint us uh, different topics. Now, the topic that he appointed for me was the covenants of Abraham. Now, I, I took it a little uh, farther, I think, than what he had intended. That study ended up turning into a study with uh, the line of Joseph so we ended up connecting uh, the chronology of the story of Joseph um, to uh, the two 2520s. And part of it was a study that uh, was done by Johannes Koletsky back in 2010. But in 2016, that's how I ended up um, studying that. It was, it was an assignment. Now, I had chosen it because he had asked anybody wants to do the covenants of Abraham. Now, we weren't really looking at them as uh, particularly um, how we're looking at them now. That is, we see a lot more. But the idea was that there is uh, that there are four covenants. There's a three-one combination in the covenants of Abraham. Now, um, what I'm going to show you here is what we had done oh about a year ago. Um, so this was a chart that we had made. We had taken the, oops, I have to hit that. We had taken this line going from creation to the new heavens and the new earth. And, and that line uh, then had in it a waymark called literal Israel. And then we expanded literal Israel into uh, seven waymarks. And you can see then I have this other way, Mark, which uh, I call Canaan. And um, so I probably should have, under literal Israel, you see these seven way marks. Um, so this way, Mark, even though I put Canaan here, uh, really is dealing with, um, it's, it's, it's actually a way, Mark, that is a zoom into this way, Mark. Um, so... So I'm not sure how these should be put together. At some point, I'm going to sort these out in a bit more detail. But this was our working uh, uh, copy at the time. Now, what you can see here in this line, which says Canaan, this is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Canaan. So, you know, it's probably that first arrival of the first uh, angel's message where it says Israel's 12 sons. Maybe I could have identified this one in that way, but I, I think it's a bit more complicated than what I have here. But what we can see is we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the first, second, and third angels' messages. And so that's what we're going to address. Now, I'm, I'm not going to end up using this chart. We're going to draw it out on a line. Um, and we're going to use the Bible to do this. <clears throat> So 
um, Abraham is going to be called out of or of the Chaldees. And that's going to happen in uh, Genesis chapter 11. So we're going to turn there. Now, after we have the Tower of Babel, we're going to have Shem's descendants. And then we finally get to Terah. Terah lived 70 years and begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And uh, what's often misunderstood is that Abraham was born when Terah was 70 years old. We know that's not the case. Um, that would have been Nahor, who was the eldest, was born then. And uh, so Abraham is going to be born later because we know uh, that Terah lived to be 205 years old. And when he was 205 years old, um, Abraham is going to be 75 years old. So if you take 75 from 205, you'll find that Abraham would have been born when Terah was 130. So this is pretty well known, but I have seen people trying to do the chronology and um, assuming that Abraham is born when Terah is um, <clears throat> uh, what they have here, a 70 years old, right? So, so, so that's just, so you add the, Terah lived 70 years, you're going to add um, to get to, right, so to get to that, that's 75, yes, so what did I say? How old is he? 205 years, so if you take yeah, so if you take that, so that means the difference between uh, Nahor, who's um, the oldest, or actually Haran's probably the oldest. I'm not sure whether it's Nahor or Haran. Um, Haran is going to die uh, first. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember. Uh, and then the place Haran is named after Haran. Uh, uh, so I don't remember here. Uh, there's some detail I'm forgetting. But anyway, the point is uh, that after the difference in age from the eldest to the youngest is going to be um, <clears throat> uh, it's going to be what? 60 years difference. So you add an extra 60 years onto that, that number. So that's where, so some people have a chronology that's 60 years shorter uh, by simply uh, assuming that Abraham is born when Terra is 70 years of age instead of 130. Okay. Now it's, um, now, when we read this here, I mean, we know that Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees um, because they're going to go forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, it says in 1131. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son's, Ab Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. So we know that he's going to be called out of Haran. And Ur is mentioned here in, and it's going to be Genesis 15, 7. And where he says, um, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give this land to inherit it. So that's going to be uh, this covenant when it is ratified formalized so we know that he came out of Ur of the Chaldees but we don't have a uh, a call mentioned there in chapter 11 so we know that he's brought out of Ur of the Chaldees but he's specifically called when he's in Haran so that's going to be chapter 12 now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, 
and from thy father's house unto a land I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So one of the things, well, there's a few things we see here, but one of the things we see is the blessings and the cursings are being applied uh, to this covenant made with Abraham. So the covenant has attached to it blessings and cursings. And we know that there is uh, steps involved in this. Get thee out of, of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house. So that's the th first three steps. And then unto a land that I will show thee, this is a three-one combination. Can we agree with that? That this, this call has this three plus one step. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, so in this covenant that's given here in Genesis chapter 12 um, is the seed, no pun intended, of this promise. And God is choosing Abraham uh, to make a great nation. And this goes back to the promise uh, given in the Garden of Eden regarding the promised seed. And so Abraham now is being chosen. And we know how old he is. It says, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So even though we know that he comes out of Ur, um, and based on an Ellen White statement, it appears to be five years before he leaves Haran. Um, but the call or the covenant is made here in Genesis chapter 12. We don't hear it mentioned in chapter 11. But God refers back and says that he lead, led him out of Ur. So there is these two places, Ur and Haran. But he's given this covenant here when he's in Haran. And he's going to uh, follow this, uh, the steps that are needed. So first he has to get out of the country. So he's still technically in Babylon. And then from thy kindred. Right. So that means not necessarily your family, but the whole tribe, all the people that you're related to, and also from thy father's house. Now, we know that's not going to happen um, until he separates from Lot. So there is this steps that he has to take. It doesn't happen all at once. <clears throat> and then, of course, the blessings and the curses, we're going to see those are tied uh, to the blessings and curses that occur later with uh, the children of Israel and when they enter into the land. So Moses is going to direct them uh, to go to Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, and there they're going to uh, recite these blessings and curses. And that's Deuteronomy 28. Well, Deuteronomy 28 says what they're going to say, and then, of course, later in the book of Joshua, they actually act out what Moses had directed them to do. <clears throat> now, we're, we're going to skip a lot of things here. We're not going to go through all of these chapters and read everything. But what we will note is that um, Abraham and Lot will separate in chapter 13. And then uh, there's going to be this battle where Abraham is going to have to rescue Lot. And that's, of course, where he's going to meet Melchizedek, right? Abraham is blessed by Melchizedek. And there's lots of things here in this story that we, we could look at if we were zooming in on this study. But these are just the covenants uh, of Abraham. <clears throat> and then we uh, have the covenant is going to be ratified. So this is going to be... Um, when Abraham is uh, talking to God and that he doesn't have a child and that Eliezer, which is his steward of Damascus, you know, he can be mine heir because I haven't been given any children. And, uh, but the word of the Lord comes to him saying, this shall not be thine heir, 
but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And this is when he brings him forth abroad and he looks towards the heavens and he's told to number the stars if you're able to number them. And he says, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. And then God says, I, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, take me an heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, uh, a ram of three years old, and a turtle and a young pigeon. And he took all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. Now, this was one of the, the main chapters that I looked at when I was given the assignment in 2016, because I recognized the structural chiasm. And then we addressed uh, the four generations that are going to be talked about. Um, it says in verse 13, Know of surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So there's quite a little bit here um, from a chronological perspective. We know that there's 400 years of affliction. This is a controversial uh, verse because um, some people believe it's 400 years that they're in Egypt, which is not what it says. Um, and then it says as well that they're going to come out in the fourth generation. So we know that they're going to be in Egypt uh, for, for, for the four generations before they come out. And so that's so that's why it's a little confusing in how it's written uh, from the understanding of how we would read this. But once we look at uh, the context and all of the other information we have in the scriptures, the chronology that's given in the Bible, uh, we know that it's they're not in Egypt for 400 years, but for 215 years. And, um, and then we see the, these animals are cut in half, and then this... A uh, smoking furnace and a burning lamp are going to pass between those pieces. And there's lots of symbolism here that we're not going to go into. But this is the second covenant. Now, with this covenant is also um, something interesting that is said. It says, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this, um, the land of Israel, does it ever reach to the river Euphrates? No, I don't think so. Because Syria or, or Aram, as they're called, the Aramites, the Aramitic peoples, uh, they're going to uh, be between uh, the river Euphrates and uh, the river Euphrates. Jordan with parts of that area on the east side of the river Jordan where the Israelites are going to inhabit. So the land of Israel never goes to the river Euphrates, which is uh, an interesting point. But also it's going to mention uh, 10 nations. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaims, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Zebusites. So why does it mention these? Uh, didn't we discuss that as part of being the, um, the Decopolis or whatever it is? Um, the... Oh, I, I can't remember the, the phraseology. 
Okay. Well, but they were the, the that was the basis for the the ten toes, wasn't it? Okay, so the ten, right? So this is the ten nations. It's a symbol of the world, right? Yeah, it's a complete, right? Just like you have the number three, and the number seven, and the number ten. These are all numbers that represent completeness. And, and also, uh, so three, seven, 10, um, and we have also the number 12, the number, number of the covenant. Right? And if we multiply those together, uh, 3, 7, 10, and 12, you get 25, 20. So just a, a little aside there. But yes, you have these 10 nations. Now, it, it's just kind of a weird sentence because it says, in the same day that the, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and then it just lists these nations. It doesn't really say anything about them. Right now, these, of course, are the nations that inhabit that land. Right. So it would be that he's giving them this land of these nations. But the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Verse 16. So their iniquity has to be full before they will be given that land. That's the idea that's being presented here. Just kind of seems odd how it's written. Now, um, there's the whole story of Sarai and Hagar. We're going to know about the fact that Ishmael is going to be born. But we're, we're going to skip that, and we're going to look at Genesis 17. So Genesis 17 is the covenant of circumcision. So again, just like in chapter 12, in chapter 15, we have the covenant there. Chapter 12 is the, the, the giving of the covenant, covenant. The ratification of that covenant um, is done at least symbolically with this chiasm of these animals, these sacrificial animals, with um, a representation of Christ passing between these carcasses in a dream that he has. So he sees this when he's in a sleep, in a dream. And then in chapter 17, after he is given Isaac as a son, so when he's 100 years old, right, he's going to be given this son, and then he's going to be given this rite of circumcision. Um, so he says here, well, he's going to be given it beforehand, but he's going to obviously, uh, after his son's born, that's when he's going to circumcise him. So I'm just going to read this here. It says, when Abram was 90, 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. So here we have the third time the covenant is given is this name change. So this becomes a symbol that we can look at in the lines. And basically, I mean, this is the original pattern if we're going to address these lines um, that are given here in this covenant made uh, with Abraham or Abram. And he becomes Abraham. And, and I will make the exceedingly fruitful, exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. 
and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. And this is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that shall, soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So here we have this, this sign of circumcision, which is on the eighth day, when the child's eight days old, um, that this is going to be the sign of the covenant. And we know later baptism uh, represents this same covenant in that this is a death of self. The flesh is being put to death. That's what it symbolizes. So not trusting in the flesh, but trusting in God. And then, of course, Isaac is going to be promised, and he's going to be born, right? So, but we have, and he's going to be circumcised. And Abraham himself is also going to be circumcised. So, well, we, we actually, this is an interesting verse here. So it says, Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael, his son. So Ishmael is the one being circumcised here. And Abraham is going to be circumcised. So he's circumcised when he's 99. And then, um, so then we're going to have uh, this other story, which we're going to skip. Uh, and God is going to rescue Lot from the destruction of, uh, let me see here, Sodom and Gomorrah. And then we're going to have Abraham and Abimelech, the story there. And we went through these. And then we're going to have the birth of Isaac. So we're going to have Isaac born in Genesis 21. And he's going to be circumcised when he's eight days old. And Abraham's 100 years old, right? And then we're going to have Abraham offering up Isaac. Now, now we say that this is the fourth, that this is the covenant, uh, the fourth covenant. So we're, we're going to draw this on the board. And I'm just going to switch these here. I'm just going to go to my camera. So we're going to have Genesis chapter 12. That's going to be um Haran and then you're going to have Genesis 15 and that's going to be um the covenant ratified so this is going to be the second one and then you're going to have Genesis 15 or 17 pardon me and that's going to be the circumcision Spell circumcision. This is the ratification. And what we would say is this is the arrival of the first angel. Maybe I'll do it this way. Um, yeah, we, we got it down here. I'll leave it there for now. And then we're going to have um, Genesis 22. So Genesis 22 is the fourth. 
But we know the fourth is also the second. So how does Genesis 22 relate to this, to Genesis 15? So this is the first, second, and third. This is the fourth. Genesis 22 is another reform line. It's, it's the fourth. It's also the second. How do we relate these together? Let's see if we get that better. Your thoughts on that? Question again. The question is, how does um, the fourth, how is this the second? So this is the ratification. Ratif I don't know why I did that. Ratification of, we covered it. So this you know, just off the top of my head, um, that's the first, second, and third angel's message, followed by the fourth. The fourth is actually the second. Right. So how is Genesis, Genesis 22, Genesis 15? Mm. Okay. So I, this, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Okay. So this is a chiasm. It's this chiasm. Right? This is Christ in the midst of the week. That's what's being represented in Genesis 15. Okay. Right? This is the cross. Now, because he's going to have those animals, you know, cut in half. And we're going to say that this is the week of Christ. This is this is this is the confirming of the covenant. With many for one week, Daniel chapter nine, right? And this is, that's the ratification of a covenant. That's what a confirming of a covenant is. Chapter 15 is where uh, the, the lamp and the furnace pass through, pass between the pieces, right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I get it now. Yeah. Okay. And, and so in Genesis 22, we're going to see Abraham going up to Mount Moriah with Isaac, but without a sacrifice. And he says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And the Hebrew is obscure. You could translate it as God is going to provide himself for a sacrifice, or God himself is going to provide a sacrifice. You could read it either way. But we know it, it's literally both, because God does provide a sacrifice. They're going to have a ram in a thicket. But we also know that God is going to provide himself as a sacrifice through Christ, right? So, so this is right. also the cross. So this is this message. Now, circumcision is the third. So we have the first angel, and we have then the second angel and the third angel. Now, these also could be part of a bigger line. We're just dealing with Right now, we're dealing with um, Abraham's covenants, right? So Abraham's covenants give us this 3-1 combination. It gives us a reform line, and we could look at this in more detail, but we can see that this it exists within the story of Abraham himself. But the line that we're addressing is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, right? We're we also have a 3-1 combination. So I'm going to draw this above here. There's enough room there. Right? So we have another line that we could do, which is Abram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and Yosef. And these are also the same line you could say this is the first the second the third and the fourth and so 
we then would say that this line here of the covenants is a zoom into this way mark. That is, it's, it's the line of Abraham. But even then, it's the line of Abraham in a very specific way, because Abraham has more than one line. There's other ways we could look at Abraham's line. This is just looking at the line of the covenants. We could look at uh, his line dealing with his descendants themselves, right? So we could look at, at this in a different way. But I just wanted to show that we could take, this is what I did in 2016, basically, is what I was supposed to be doing. But I ended up focusing upon this one the most, but as I focused upon Genesis 15. But I did address all of this, all of this line. This was what I originally presented. And then from that, I ended up with the story of Joseph. So this basic idea of a line can be seen in the covenants. Now, it was interesting that when we looked at these chapters, we got this number which was, anybody remember? Wasn't the total 2520? No. What do we, I'm sorry, I can't, I, I can't really actually. Okay, so it's 67,320. And that is 12 times 15 times 17 times 22. Um, I don't even know if I was recording this properly. There. I don't think I, you, you saw me drawing all this out in the way that I recorded it, unfortunately, because I didn't, uh, I just didn't stop sharing my screen. So, um, stop the share. Sorry about that. So anybody watching it, they're just going to have a little picture there. There it is. Okay. Sorry about that. So, um, so we can see here, Genesis 15, or 12, 15, 17, and 22. We got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. That's a three, one combination. The three plus the fourth. We see this here as well. And when we looked at these chapters, we got this number, 12 times 15 times 17 times 22 equals 67,320. And if we divide this by 360, what do we get? Anybody know? So if we divide this by 360, we get 187. Okay, so that was an interesting detail. So. so we have this, this structure of these lines. Okay, now we'll go to, go back to the Bible. So we had all of these th four places where we have this covenant. Now, when we do this, I'm, I'm gonna go to, uh, PowerPoint here. Um, we have this other line, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob is this main line. So I'm just going to do this here. Let me get rid of this because this is just a copy of the slide. So I want to bring this up here. 
Now you can see in this line, we actually have um, the line of the covenants, right? Because we can do this by looking at If we want to look at it this way, Genesis 12, 15, 17, and we could put Genesis here, uh, 22, if we wanted to. That is, we can see that these covenants could be seen as the arrival of the first message, um, the formalization of the message, the empowerment of the message, and um, and then Genesis twenty two would be the arrival of the second angel's message. So there are different ways in which we could do this line, and I mean, and this line instead of calling it uh, Canaan, I would just call it Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because the Bible uses that expression all the time. So we could call this the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now with this line, we also know that there's Joseph. And so Joseph is the fourth. Now, why do I say that? Why do I say Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph is the fourth? What would you he's the fourth generation. Okay, he's uh, the fourth generation. Yeah. And so one of the things we see is that um, there's four generations that lead to going into Egypt. Jacob's going to be the first that goes into Egypt. He's going to go into Egypt 22 years uh, before Jacob does, or, or Joseph goes 20 years before, 22 years before Jacob does, right? Um, so we, we could take this line just like I had drawn it up on the whiteboard, and that, that line represents um, the fourth, right? So Joseph is the fourth, and he's the fourth generation. And then once he goes into Egypt, they're going to come out after the fourth generation. So the fourth generation that enters into Egypt is also uh, going to start the mark of the first generation. And then you're going to have the fourth generation that comes out of Egypt. A uh, question. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can we call that a repeat and an enlarge? Um. Well, I guess you could. I mean, there, there's other ways of looking at it. I mean, it is a repeat. That is, they are repeating, in a sense, history, right, in that four generations. Um, so one of the ways I've looked at it, let me see if I can find the diagram here. Um, Where I put it. Um, I'll do it this way. Uh, here's an example of there's the four generations Levi, Kohath, Amram, and Aaron. Um, here's the chart that I'm looking for. So this is the 430 years. Now you will find this uh, basic idea represented in the books, Patriarchs and Prophets in um, one of the, uh, I guess it's one of the note. I can't remember if it's note number three, uh, but they're gonna do this calculation. The 215, oh, this is not the right one. This is the, the wrong one. Here is the right one. Um, here, so they're going to do this calculation you see down at the bottom, uh, the 25, the 60, and then um, 
you're going to see the 91 here and the 17. And, and then you're going to have the 22. So there's different ways you could look at this. But if you look at how old Abraham is when he leaves Haran, and then how old uh, he is when Isaac is born, that's going to be uh, 25 years. And then Isaac is going to have Jacob and Esau when he's 60. And then, um, and then Jacob is going to be 91 when Joseph is born. And Joseph is going to be uh, 39 when he enters into Egypt. And Jacob will be 130. So you can see that uh, Joseph was born when Jacob was 91. Right? So this period of 215 years has four generations. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph goes down into Egypt. So it depends how you would count this. You could say that's that's the fourth generation, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It's the fourth generation. And then the same generation, because Joseph and Levi are in the same, same generation, but they're going to come out in the fourth generation. Levi, Kohath, Amram, and Aaron are going to be counted. Those are the ones where they're going to give us their ages. It would be nice if they gave us the ages of how old they were when their children are born. They're just going to give us how long they lived. Um, but those are the ones that they give us a chronology of. And it's going to be, of course, uh, Aaron that marks the start of that fourth generation. And it's going to be in the fourth generation. Aaron's course is going to be 83 years old when they come out of Egypt. But he's still the fourth generation. Somebody could argue, well, there's more generations because they, you know, he has sons and so forth. But that's how we would look at it. Um, that it's it's still in the fourth generation that they come out of Egypt. Um, so there's four generations to Egypt, four generations out of Egypt. Okay. So. I think that's an important uh, point there. Now, we're going to go to to find where I was. Just more details regarding these structural chiasms, the 430 years. Uh, <clears throat> I guess what they want to be. So we have Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I don't know why I put the hand there. So this is the line that we have. <clears throat> and we know we can add Joseph there. Now, we can see that in this line, we have an arrival of a message. And that's going to be God uh, calling Abraham out of Haran. And this is going to be formalized, as we said, with the ratification of this covenant. And Genesis 17 is going to be the empowerment of that, and Genesis 22 is uh, the arrival of a second message, which is going to be Isaac and his circumcision, or not his circumcision, his, when he's offered up, right? So you have the circumcision in chapter 17, and then Isaac is going to be offered up, and that's the cross, right? The second angel arrives at the cross, that is, it's the center of this chiasm.
right? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Now, the darkness, then, we always have to address the darkness and these messages. So the darkness has to do with the promise that was made um, to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden regarding the promised seed. And we know that the story of Noah uh, continues that promise. We have this, um, uh, the inheritance that's passed down supposedly through the eldest son, but it never seems to be that way. Abraham, for instance, isn't the eldest. Um, uh, and then you had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well, Japheth, uh, you know, represents uh, um, <clears throat> basically the Caucasian race, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but it's Shem that's going to be the one uh, that's going to be um, uh, the one through which the promised seed comes. And he's not the oldest. Right. So I think it's Japheth that's the oldest. So he's not going to receive the double portion, the kingship, and the, the priesthood. That's going to be passed down um, through a younger son. And the same here in this case. It's going to be Abraham or Abram who receives this call and is now the chosen seed. And it's going to be his seed. And we know that when it goes down through his seed, uh, Reuben, who's the eldest, is not going to receive either the kingship double portion or even uh, the priesthood. The priesthood goes to Levi, double portion goes to Joseph, and the kingship goes to Judah. So we, we see here in this formalization of this message, then, that this is going to be about the seed going into captivity. So it's, it's giving us an illustration of this covenant and what this means, that they're going to be afflicted for 400 years. They're going to go into a land that was not theirs. And, but when they come out, they're going to come out with a great substance, and that's going to be in the fourth generation. Now, the empowerment of this message would, of course, be circumcision, because circumcision is, what, what is it a sign of in relationship to the covenant that was given in the Garden of Eden? What is circumcision representing? Um, that was, uh, well, we consider it uh, like baptism for, uh, I mean, to us. I, I'm not sure uh, how it relates in Adam and Eve, though. Okay, well, there's the promised seed. The seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. The serpent would bruise his heel. Right? Yeah, yeah right. Okay, so Christ is going to crush the head of the serpent, but he's going to experience the cross. He's going to take upon humanity. He's going to be afflicted. And, and so circumcision represents this death to self as a symbol. It's the empowering of this message of the promised seed that was given to Adam and Eve. And, and it's given here as an illustration of that. But it's also not trusting in the flesh. It's trusting into this original promise that God had, had given. And so in this covenant that's made with Abraham, God is going to give him this as a sign or a seal of the righteousness which he had by faith. Right? Abraham, all of this is of faith. Now, when we look at the story of Abraham, I mean, we can see his lack of belief. Right? I mean, he's called out of Ur, but he doesn't really come out right away. He doesn't separate from his kindred right away. And then he, he doesn't separate from his father's house right away. And, and then, you know, God comes to him when he's saying, well, you made this promise to me, uh, but I don't have a seed. I don't have a son. So can my, my steward be, the, be mine heir? And God says, no, you know, it's going to be out of thine own bowels. And then he's going to, of course, do everything he can to try to produce this seed because of what his wife says. And he produces Ishmael, but God says, no, it's not going to be Ishmael. 
And that's when God gives him this message. Now, think about it here. Who's circumcised in Genesis 17? Uh, that was Abraham and Isaac, or Ishmael. Ishmael, right? So you can see, if you look at Millerite history, August 11th, 1840, that's going to be Islam. They're going to be marked at the empowerment of the first angel. Right? Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Now, of course, we can see there's lots of ways we could construct these lines. That is, this is a line that's actually addressing Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it also addresses Ishmael, and that's going to be at the way mark that is the arrival of the, or the empowerment of the first message. So it's empowered with the end of the second woe, August 11th, 1840. But we see also here that empowerment is going to occur with the circumcision being given, but it's Ishmael who's circumcised in Genesis 17, not Isaac. And then Isaac is going to be offered up as a sacrifice in Genesis 22. So we have a first message. In order to receive the second message, you have to be benefited by the first message, right? If you're, if you're, benef if you're benefited by the first message, you can receive the second message. Now, the second message is Isaac. Now, Isaac is not a child when he's offered up. So Isaac, it's his understanding of the cross that represents the arrival of the second angel. Can we agree with that point? Yes. Okay. Now, then we have a formalization and empowerment, but we have nothing marked there on this. We just have some numbers. Right, so this so what would be the formalization of this second angel and then the empowerment of this second angel? What is it in the story of Isaac uh, that would represent these um, the formalization and empowerment? And even in the story of Jacob, what is it that is is this just the birth of Jacob? Is this some other thing in Jacob's life that we would mark? Um, would we mark Jacob, uh, the third angel, um, arrival when he was wrestling with them? Okay. Well, that's an interesting point. I mean, we do have a line of Isaac, and we do have a line of Jacob, and we do have a line of Abraham, right? So each of these have their own lines. But if we're going to say that the arrival of the second angel is the sacrifice of Isaac, then we would have to look at um, the events in Isaac's life. And, and the first thing that you're going to have is the death of Sarah and burial. And then you're going to have Isaac and Rebecca. And then you're going to have Abraham's death. Now, in the story of Isaac and Rebecca, um, uh, we know that Isaac is going to be comforted after his mother's death when he marries Rebecca. And, and I think a simple way to look at this would be uh, the death and burial of Sarah as the formalization of this second angel. Now, how could that be? What does the death of Sarah and then his marriage to Rebecca have to do with Isaac and uh, the cross, the second angel that arrives uh, in Genesis 22? So I'm going to say this is Genesis 22. 
or not 22, 23. And this is going to be Genesis 24. You need you need to fix twenty two to twenty three. Yeah, sorry about that. There we go. So you got Genesis twenty two, twenty three, and twenty four. That's going to be the second angel. That actually makes sense. Okay, why? Can you explain why? Uh, well, for one thing, you remember that he was comforted. Right now, haven't we got? Isn't part of that that comforter part of the spirit, the okay. Holy Spirit? Do okay, we recognize it as that. Okay, um, we could. So, I mean, and this is just a suggestion. But if we were going to do this, we we have the comforting of the Holy Spirit. You're saying. That's going to be the empowerment of the second angel. Now, we have other things in, in Isaac's life. He's going to be blessed, right? So uh, God's going to make a promise to him. Uh, there's the story of Isaac and Abimelech. But I put those more as part of the, the line of Isaac. Because remember, this is about the promised seed, isn't it? Yes. Okay. That's what we're that's what we were talking about. It's it's the line of the promised seed. Yeah. Now, so when it says that he's comforted, I mean, we know obviously he missed his mother. So to have a female in his life again is comfort. But there must be more to it than just um that he now has a female in his life, that he's he's comforted in that way. It must have something to do with the promise. Yeah, you would think. Mm -hmm. Because this is the line of the promised seed. Mm -hmm. So one is he knows now that he has a wife and that 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 promise can carry on. So, I mean, there are different ways we can construct this line. So I'm not saying that this is the best way to construct it. But since Jacob is the rival of the third angel, and he also has his own line, I mean, Jacob implies lots of things. That is, there's not just Jacob arrives, and that's it. Yeah, there's a lot it, to do with Jacob. Because Jacob's going to be tied up with, with his sons as well. Right. So when we look, if we zoom into that third angel arriving, Jacob, it's going to be the story of Jacob and his 12 sons. Right. Right. The okay. promised seed, the line of the promised seed. Right. Um, so that's what this this line and we could even say that this line is, you know, addressing the promised seed in some way. But we're just going to say Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is the name of this line. So the idea here, now, it went a lot better in my head before I did the presentation. It was, I, I started to forget, I was forgetting details. And as we started to look at it, I started to realize there was, was things I was forgetting. Um, but we can see here that we can construct this line. And this is a reasonable line. And um, now, we, even when we look at the Sarah's death and burial, um, one of the things that happens in that chapter, because there's more to it, uh, remember Abraham is says, um, he speaks to the son of Heth, sons of Heth, I'm a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Right. So we know that there is going to be um, this field that is purchased. So there's a lot more to it. Right. Because we can go into this uh, formalization of the second angel 
and we can actually construct a line. And that line is going to expand um, and cover much more than just that event itself. That is, each one of these way marks is representing a period of darkness, an increase of light, a formalization of a message, an empowerment of a message, an arrival of a second message, its formalization and empowerment, and an arrival of the third. And, you know, for people who've been looking at these studies, just the simple presentation of the lines, you can see that they're still very involved. There's lots and lots and lots of detail. Um, because as you look at each of these lines in each of these way marks, there's stories within stories that are illustrating our history. Because that's, that's the main thing that we see when we look at lines in the past, it's the effect of every vision. All of these lines come together at the end of time. So we're gonna leave it there for now. We went a little bit over, but um, we're gonna come back to this next week. We're gonna go over again next week and try to build upon this. Okay, so let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this afternoon. I pray for those that watch it, that they can understand it um, and help me uh, again in presenting these things each time. Help us to see how these lines relate uh, to our time as well, but help us to understand them as they applied in the past. Be with each person. May your Holy Spirit teach them, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Theodore.